Well, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to this one of the most interesting days of uh, Purdue campus life and the calendar. Um, my name is Suresh Garamella. I'm the Executive Vice President for Research and Partnerships and a professor of mechanical engineering. Um, it is truly a privilege for me to participate in this event. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear about our faculty accomplishments and the work they do, especially Mike, who I've, uh, whom I've heard uh, in, in, on previous occasions and had uh, chances to actually honor him before as well. Well, 2017, this year, marks the third year of the Arden L. Bement Jr. Award. This award was established by distinguished professor emeritus Arden Bement and his wife, Louise, uh, to annually recognize a Purdue member for recent outstanding accomplishments in pure and applied sciences and engineering. The Arden Bement Jr. Award winners are nominated by their peers and selected by a faculty committee. Well, we're very pleased today that Arden is actually with us in the audience. Uh, please give a hearty applause to David A. Ross, Distinguished Engineering Professor Emeritus, Arden Bement. And Arden, would you like to come up and say a few words? Well, thank you very much, Suresh, for those kind words. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, being emeritus, I live in the state of Ohio instead of the state of Indiana. And the one thing I really miss is Purdue University. I mean, I really do miss it. And I miss the uh, collegial relationship with the faculty. But the one thing I get to do is I get to come back here once a year and meet some of the most outstanding scientists in the country as well as in the world uh, through the prize. And I'm especially pleased to be here to welcome Mike Atala and to uh, have an opportunity to discuss his work and uh, areas of interest. And the same thing applies to the former awardees of, of the prize. So uh, as long as I live, I hope I'll be able to enjoy that every year uh, to come back to campus and have a scientific or an engineering research uh, discussion with the, the prize winner. And this year's prize winner is really, truly outstanding, as the other two winners have been. So I also want to uh, congratulate the committee, the selection committee for the, uh, the prize, to continue their record of picking really, truly outstanding scientists. Thank you. Thank you, Arden. I will have someone send you the next 50 years of uh, dates for this event, so please put them on your calendar. We booked this room ahead of time. Uh, so uh, uh, our previous uh, award winners, some of them will join us at, uh, at the recognition event later uh, this evening. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage Petros Dunaeus, uh, who is Associate Professor in Computer Science, and he will introduce this year's recipient of the Arden L. Bement Jr. Award, um, and uh, awardee who is, of course, as you've heard now, Distinguished Professor of Computer Science, Mikhail Atala. Sunil Prabhakar, who is, who is the head of the department and who is the nominator for this year's award, um, could not be here today, and he's asked Professor Dreneus to uh, introduce him. Please uh, welcome Professor Dreneus. So thank you very much. Hello, and uh, welcome to the Bement Distinguished Lecture. Uh, so I'm Professor Dreneas. I'm uh, a professor at uh, the Computer Science Department of Purdue University. Uh, I chair the department's uh, awards committee, and I was a co-nominator along with uh, Sunil Prabhakar for, uh, um, uh, for Dr. Michael Atala for this esteemed award. It's uh, my privilege today to tell you a few things about uh, Mike Atala um, before he addresses us uh, today. So, Professor Atala has distinguished himself as uh, an authority in the fields of theoretical computer science, distributed computing, and cybersecurity. He is truly known throughout the world for research that addresses today's most challenging computational and security issues. 
He has made significant and groundbreaking contributions in the design, analysis, and implementation of efficient processing and security protections for computer-based technologies. He, was, he is the co-founder of Arcs and Technologies, a company whose software is currently used in over half a billion, 500 million devices worldwide. The fundamental principle underlying Arcs and Innovations is to inject self-protective mechanisms in software, making it basically harder to hack. He has been a member of the Purdue faculty since 1982, after he completed his PhD at Johns Hopkins University. He was named a full professor in 1989, and he has been a distinguished professor since 2004. His work has been recognized in many ways. That includes the Test of Time Award at the 2015 ACM Conference on Computer and Communication Security. That's a leading conference in Mike's field. The 2016 Purdue Sigma Xi Faculty Research Award, the 2013 Purdue Outstanding Commercialization Award. He has been keynote and invited speaker at numerous national and international meetings. He has served on the editorial boards of top journals. He has served on the program committees of top conferences and workshops in his field. He was selected in 1999 as one of the best teachers in the history of Purdue University. And he has been included in Purdue's book of great teachers. Last but not least, he's a fellow of both major societies in our field, the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM, and the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE. And now I would like to welcome Mike Atala to the lectern to hear what he has to say on opportunities and perils of the cyber revolution. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Petras, for this uh, very kind introduction. And thank you, Suresh, and thank you, Pr uh, Professor Bement, for your generosity and, um, and for being such a great role model for us all. Um, I would like to talk about this only as, as it pertains to, so that I can tie it to my work that I will present, uh, my specific results that I will give you an overview of. Um, and I'll just tie them to these themes here, so I won't, I don't even, won't even come close to addressing the, these issues in, uh, in greater, in all the detail that they deserve. Uh, so, uh, you know about the cyber revolution. It has been driven by rapid advances in computing, storage, and communication. A combination of better hardware. You've all heard of uh, um, um, the doubling of speed every two years, uh, Moore's law. and. Uh, and more importantly, better ways of using it. And it has given us huge benefits. Our lives have improved. And it's likely to get much better. Uh, we might be relieved from the tyranny of having to drive and uh, cars. And, and, and uh, we might be able to have, uh, we, we already have remote surgeries and all kinds of uh, such things. Uh, truly wonderful things. Uh, there are, unfortunately, with complexity comes vulnerability always throughout history, this has been the case, even going back to the Roman Empire. I mean, it's always a feature of complex, complex systems and societies that they're more vulnerable. And there are huge security hazards. And they're also just like the benefits are likely to get better, the hazards are likely to get worse. Uh, computer crime, I don't need to tell you that. You can read the newspaper. But we, you, what you might not know is what you read in the newspaper is 10% of what really happens. Um, the computer crime by both insiders and outsiders is widely underreported. You can imagine why they don't report it. They only report it if the law, if the law requires them to report it. Otherwise, they just hush hush it. The reason is obvious. It drives the stock price down. It, uh, it makes you look incompetent. Uh, and it's just it's, it's bad for business. Um, so um, and I have to say, that avoiding the perils, we will do our best to avoid the perils. I will contribute to that. Others have contributed a lot to that. But it's going to be an uphill uh, struggle because the odds inherently favor the offense over the defense uh, for various reasons. It's difficult to predict an attack, which attack method will be used. You might say, protect against all of them. Well, two things about that. It's very expensive, first. And second, how do you protect against something you don't even know about? Because there's a surprising element in all the attacks sometimes. So, and it's difficult to detect an ongoing attack. Uh, and then there's the attribution problem. Who has done it? Uh, 
I, it's not, the answer is not easy to come, to come up with. When Estonia was attacked as a country and brought to its knees in a cyber sense in 2007, a third of the computers involved were from our country, from the United States. It doesn't mean we attacked Estonia. It means we had com computers that were compromised and were used in the attack. I don't need to tell you who attacked Estonia, of course. We all know that. I major problem, uh, which really is not a technical problem, but I have to acknowledge that it's a major problem, is the misaligned incentives. So a lot of the things you read about could have been avoided had known technologies been deployed. So there are th technologies that solve many of the problems of cybersecurity that are just not deployed. Um, and the problem, the, the reason they're not deployed is not a technical reason, it's an incentives reason. Those who make the decision to deploy, uh, the cost-benefit analysis they make is not, is not good. Um, basically, the benefits is their benefits as executives. The costs are not theirs, though. Uh, if something bad happens, the costs are borne by you, who gets your identity stolen, society as a whole. And, and it's amazing that there is no clawback, that they mess up. And they get to keep their bonus. Anyway, there's no clawback. There's no regurgitation of the ill-gotten gains by, in any way. And this is not just a cybersecurity problem. This is a problem in finance. This is what gave us the crisis of 2007. I don't need to, you know. So this is bigger than me, this problem. Uh, but we have to acknowledge its existence, because here we are deploying, developing wonderful technologies, and they, you don't see them in use. But there's a lesson in that major problem of misaligned incentives. Is if you want people to adopt it, you have to make it ridiculously cheap. You have to make it not interfere with the bonus of the executive, with the profits, with, you know, they, they, it has to be ridiculously cheap, ridiculously unobtrusive, not interfere with time to market, with, with you know, because the cost-benefit analysis, analysis is crooked in some sense. You have to make the cost ridiculously low. Then it becomes compelling to adopt it. And, and I, I will talk more about that later. And finally, I would like to say that the cyber revolution has, gave small, has given small groups disproportionate and unprecedented power to inflict huge damage. Um, and not just the cyber revolution, but in general, technology has empowered small groups. We've never been in that situation. I mean, in the history of the human species, we've never had a situation where such small numbers of people could wreak such havoc on so many. Uh, think about it. I mean, you go back to the days of the Roman Empire. You have 12 disgruntled people in the Roman Empire. What could they do? OK, they could, the 12 of them, get their hands on the most fearsome weapon of the time, which was the short Roman sword, the gladius, uh, from which the word gladiator came. And OK, so they got 12 short Roman swords and let them do the damage that they can do. What can they do? They can't affect millions. But look what's happening now. Uh, you know, someone in their basement in some foreign country could, with a few clicks, uh, you know, bring major corporations uh, uh, unprecedented grief. So this is a very unique situation, uh, I'm afraid. If someone can point me to, to history in which really tiny numbers of people could have such hugely disproportionate impact, not by a fluke, but in a systematic way and repeatable way. I know World War I and the archbishops shooting and all that, but that was, you know, that was not a systemic thing. It was, it was a, an unlucky and unfortunate uh, event. So uh, progress, on the other hand, we can do something about, a lot about, and that will require uh, better algorithms and protocols. The hardware bonus um, is slowing down, I would say. And uh, it has never been what it's cracked up to be. This, the reason we have such fast speeds today is not Moore's law. I'm you know, sorry for, to, for my colleagues who are in hardware. I, you know, it's important. But that's not why things are so fast today. They are so fast today because of algorithms, protocols, software, what we do with the hardware. I will illustrate that in, uh, you know, in, uh, with this simple example. Suppose you have an algorithm that takes time proportional to 10 to the n. And there are such algorithms, uh, like on, in numbers. 
Uh, each of the n could be a digit in the number uh, and uh, the number of possibilities, any enumerative approach to solving a problem. I you know, imagine one that takes 10 to the n. Just imagine it. Um, this is, you're not gonna be able to solve large problems and hardware will not bail you out because a trillion fold increase times 10 to the 12 increase in hardware size would allow you to increase the problem sizes that you can solve by a pathetic 12. That's not very impressive. Um, I mean, if we can do things faster, dramatically faster for such problems than our ancient uh, ancestors, you go 25 centuries ago, um, some of the problems we're, we're working on and trying to solve now and struggling with were actually attacked by the Greek philosophers in those days. And sometimes they succeeded and we still use their algorithms and sometimes they did not, and we still have a bloody nose from where they failed. We can't do it, still. But um, the point is that they were slow because they did it manually, but we, we do it with computers. But it doesn't make that much difference because, because of the exponential function, which is really, really bad news. Um, so uh, on the other hand, look at this. If the algorithm had been n, n squared, by n squared I mean n is problem size, and, and whenever I say n squared, I mean proportional, time proportional to n squared. You could get a million fold increase in problem sizes that you can solve if you have a trillion fold increase in speed. So I, the algorithms are very important, and progress in algorithms is gonna be very, very significant. Uh, What's a good algorithm? Uh, as you may guess, it's one that's not exponential, right? I mean, for sure. Uh, and uh, you know, a common definition is that it takes time proportional to n to the k for some small integer k, where n is problem size. So for example, if the input is an integer x, then n is the number of digits in its representation. Okay, it's not x, it's log x. Um, so how small should k be? And, well, it depends on problem size. In the old days, the k of three, four was, was okay, was good, but not today. Today we have massive data. And even a small k of two or three could be very impractical, in, quite impractical. Uh, if n is the number of users, if, if the graph you're dealing with is the, um, the Facebook graph, well, the number of nodes is two billion, last I checked. It was two billion. And take n to the cube and see what happens. Two billion raised to the power three. You, you know, it, it's, it, n cube is, is sometimes you, today with massive data, with truly massive data, you want linear. You don't want anything super linear. Uh, and finally, I want to say that we wish progress in algorithms, but uh, we really would like some computational problems to remain difficult. Uh, Really, we, we would be panicked if they did not remain difficult. And because a better algorithm for them can spell disaster. One such problem is factoring. What is factoring is uh, you take a large prime P, a large prime Q, you multiply them, and you obtain M, the product of two large primes. And um, given P and Q, you can compute M, but given M, it is believed difficult to come up efficiently, quickly, with P and Q. This is called the factoring a problem. And, uh, and today's cybersecurity infrastructure relies on the assumed difficulty of solving not only this problem, but other number theoretic type of problems. Not just this one. This is one of them. This is a major one. But uh, um, how important is this? This is very important. That whenever you bank online, whenever you do anything on the internet, um, if anyone came up with a, a breakthrough for, for one of these problems, like this one, the factoring, if, if some kid in their basement came up with an efficient algorithm for factoring, it would be really bad news for, for the world economy uh, because they could empty all the money from the Federal Reserve, from all the companies, and. Uh, the whole infrastructure would collapse. You'd have a depression of unprecedented proportions. Now, it's not gonna happen, but we don't have a proof that it cannot happen, okay? So what's the evidence that we have that the problem, and other, this and other problems are difficult? 
Well, the, the proof is not a proof, but it's evidence. And the evidence is, goes along these lines. Uh, for, uh, what, 25 centuries we've been trying, right? Since the days of the, the ancient Greeks. And nobody succeeded. And since everybody, since the day of the Greeks until today is so smart and hasn't been able to, probably no one in the future will. Something like that, right? But that's not a proof. And uh, well, I, I just want to say that this is, you know, it's amazing that human ingenuity, that if you hit a stumbling block in terms of, I cannot do this, people will build a contraption whose functioning, whose proper functioning relies on that difficulty. I mean, it's quite amazing. I go back to, imagine that you were one of the ancient Greeks 25 centuries ago trying to do certain computations. You would never have suspected that 25 centuries later, people would still be struggling with what you're doing, A. And then that in a period of what, a few decades, they would switch from being ecstatic at a possible solution to being terrified that it might occur. Right? I mean, just a few decades ago, I, I'm old enough to know that because um, you know, they, in the 70s is when RSA crypto system came about. And up until then, we couldn't have cared less whether someone came up with an algorithm for factoring. Well, we would have been very excited, actually. It would have been a wonderful paper. We would have presented it in our classes. But we wouldn't have been exactly panicky about it, not like today. And what has happened is there's infrastructure that has been built. You know, there's trillions of dollars at stake. And so we want this problem to be solved, but not too quickly. Not too quickly. Eventually, it will be solved because there's something coming that will solve it called quantum computers. So quantum computers are game changers in this area. But they're not here yet. They will be here at some point. So in the long run, relying on the difficulty of factoring is doomed. But you know, in the long run, we're all dead also. So it's. it's <laughs> The short run is important. Uh, and, and so we want things solved, but not too quickly. This is like a St. Augustine. It was St. Augustine, something like that. Give me, give me virtue, but not yet, not yet. We want that here to also. You know, we want, let us solve all these problems, but not quite yet. Wait until it doesn't do too much damage. So uh, here's some of my results that I will talk about. Um, two of them settle open problems. The first one and the last one. The middle two are uh, in security and have had a very large impact, I believe. And I'll tell you why they've had impact also. I'll tell you the what and the why. Who cares? I won't have time to tell you the how. And believe me, you should be grateful to me that I'm not attempting to tell you the how. <laughs> uh, but the how is, is quite involved and involves equations and things like that. And, I was told that every equation loses half the audience. And so, um, so there will be no equations uh, beyond m equal p times q. Um, so let me talk about the first one. Oh, first, whenever I say we, it's with these guys, the four students with whom the work was done. Wonderful, wonderful students, PhD students of mine. Um, uh, none of these results would have happened without them. Um, it was magic. Working with them was like magic. You know, it was fantastic. I, I miss them dearly. I, I wish I could have kept them here. Uh, but um, and it, it, let me just say that I chose them on the grounds not only of the significance of the work with them, but also recency. Recency because the results, because the, the, you know, the Bement Award is for more recent. So uh, for you know if. If my students from the, uh, from the early 80s and 90s uh, were here, I would, I would apologize to them that I did not include them because their work is just as nice. Okay? We resolved many open problems at that time also, but I can't talk about them. They're too uh, ancient, and I have to talk about more recent things. And this is one that, I, uh, that was previously open for the dawn of, from, from the dawn of computing. I mean, whenever. We had computers. We wanted to do range queries. And range queries are, uh, well, they, they, you know, uh, two-dimensional range queries. They could be one-dimensional. Basically, you have a range in an array. 
and you want to ask questions about that range, and you want a quick answer to that question. You're allowed to pre-process the array, but not too much. So you, have, you can pre-process the array in linear time, but you want to answer those questions in constant time. Constant means independent of the size of the array. So here, the open problem uh, was uh, you're given an n by n matrix of numerical values, and you want to pre-process it in time proportional to its size. You cannot do super linear. This is truly massive data, and, and you know, even log n is too big. Log of a billion is 40, and a 40-fold slowdown is not acceptable. Um, and the, 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 the query, so you have to pre-process it in linear time so that you can answer in constant time queries like the range minimum query, which specifies two rows, two columns, and you have to return quickly in constant time the smallest value in the rectangular range defined by these rows and columns. And I think I can best illustrate this with a picture. So this is the array, the two-dimensional array, and a query consists of two rows and two columns, and you have to, you have to very quickly give the minimum value in the red area or reddish area. It's very simple, very simple to state. I could never resist puzzles of this nature. It doesn't have to do with computers even. You can think about it as a puzzle, uh, you know, with paper and pencil and, and think about it, you know. I, I, so I'm allowed to touch things a constant number of times. I'm allowed to look at the input and go through it and scan it and look at it and do computations on it. Uh, in time proportional to how big it is, okay? You cannot avoid that. And then you have to answer in constant time questions about it, right? This type of question. And I thought, every time I look at how old this problem is, I keep gaining a few decades. I thought it was three decades old, and then someone pointed out to me, I think it was Petros, uh, that it was even older than that. So it's, it's ancient. From the dawn of computing, people wanted to do this. And, and uh, um, did I tell you that we solved it? Uh, that's why, I mean, that's why I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have this slide otherwise, right? I wouldn't be talking about it if we didn't solve it. So the problem is easy if it's addition instead of min. Uh, why? Because you can pre-compute sums. For example, all yellow possible real, yellow rectangles, you can pre-compute their sum, the sum of what's in them. So if you wanted the sum of the elements in, in the region of interest, it's very easy to do that, to solve the problem. Because you use something, you know, you use inclusion exclusion, and you, like, if you want the red, you can write it as a linear combination of four of the four yellows, and you can imagine which ones they would be. But the problem with min is you cannot subtract. That's the problem. There's no inverse. There is no inverse element. If you have the min of a b, you cannot, you know, and it's a, you've lost b, right? And that's the difficulty. So, uh, so we cannot, you, you know, for plus we were able to overcount and then correct by subtracting, but we can't do that here. And it eluded the best names in data structuring and uh, previously known only for one dimensional case. And that was not easy to start with. The one dimensional case was not easy. It was a major breakthrough like three decades, three decades ago. Very important problem, uh, tons of applications. Um, range minimum query. Bioinformatics textbooks have range minimum query. All kinds of issues have problems. Th this problem arises in all kinds of applied situations. Um, and you see today data is not only massive, it's also multidimensional. So one-dimensional solutions are not enough. Data is multidimensional. I mean, a record has many attributes. It doesn't have just a latitude, right, in geospatial. It has a latitude, a longitude, a precipitation, an average temperature, all kinds of data about it. And you really want to ask range. And, the, and our solution generalizes, by the way, to higher dimensions. Uh, and it is not, you know, it, it, so when, when I say it eluded the best names in data structuring, I don't mean that uh, they didn't know about it. That doesn't count. That, that, that's not elusive. Elus, elude means you wrote a paper and you were suboptimal. That's what elude means. You know, it's not. Um, an open problem, anything that's like two years old doesn't qualify as an open problem. You have to have decades and decades of history and papers written about it, et cetera, et cetera. That qualifies as, a, as an open problem. So this qualifies as an open problem. But some of my other results don't so settle open problems because they settle a problem I posed in some sense. So 
it, you know. Uh, um, unfortunately, I can't tell you as much as I would love to the, the how. Um, so I will move on. Key management in access hierarchies. Uh, so this is a, this result has uh, achieved, a, I mean, just gathered 500 citations in, in a snap, just like that. It has been very, very impactful. It has received the CCS Test of Time Award. Uh, and what is it? So it's hierarchical access control is pervasive and it's of central importance in role-based access control. So in role-based access control, they don't give you access privileges as Joe, as you, Joe or Nancy. They give you, they assign you to a role in the organization. You're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're a professor. So you get a role in the organization and you, you acquire through that role the access privileges for that role. So when you hire someone, you don't have to actually make a decision of, oh, do I let them access this file, this picture? No, no, you just assign to them the role. And uh, it's a very popular way of doing things and has gained ground over all competing approaches. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and it's modeled by a, a directed graph and access to a node implies access to all the nodes that are reachable from that node. And, um, and there's a different encryption key for each node's data. So a node in the graph has documents and information associated with it that's encrypted using a secret key, okay? And uh, you don't wanna give a user too many keys because it's impractical and inefficient, especially when updates are made. Uh, you know, if you, uh, if you wanna fire someone or hire someone or you, you, know, you wanna give them the whole key ring, so to speak. 10,000 keys, give me back your 10,000 keys and I will change them. Uh, or here is 10,000 keys in case of a hire. No, you want one key, one key. One key to rule them all. Like, you know, in, uh, and the solution is key derivation. So what is key derivation? So he, here's the picture. So this is the way the data is organized. So you have to, you have to imagine a, um, an encryption key associated with node I, an encryption key associated with node E. And there are tons of documents at each node, all encrypted with the same key, okay? And when you're assigned a role, you're assigned a node, like D, your D, for example. Well, if you're D, we give you the key for D, and we would like you to be able to derive all the keys for C, G, H, F, I, because they're reachable from D, from your role. It's very convenient. We give you the key for D, and you can derive everything else from that key for D. Not as easy as it looks. The concept is easy, but um, and it's just very convenient for updating, very convenient for everything, but how do you do it? And this is what we were able to do. And it's not, it, it's, uh, so we, you know, we give a key for D, and that's all we give you and you can derive everything you're entitled to from that. Um, so key derivation is, uh, that's what it is. And it's not, a, 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 the difficult part is having collusion resistance. So you can come up with mathematical, mathematical functions that allow the derivation to take place, but those mathematical functions would not have collusion resistance in the sense of, collusion is this. I have access to this, you have access to that. If we got together and colluded and exchanged our information, we should not be able to access more than the union of what we are entitled to in the first place. We shouldn't access some new information. And that was difficult uh, also to achieve. And we have the dynamic support for updates. And it's really nifty. It's really a nifty result. It's a long paper, but we are very fast, a practically constant time, even when the V2W path is long. So don't think for a second that we hop along the path deriving as we go along. Not for a second, that would be too slow. Uh, we don't do that, we, we just immediately derive it. Um, uh, this is key derivation. Uh, another result that, has, that I think uh, Petros mentioned that had, is deployed 500 million devices. So it's on, your lap, it's on your cell phone now as we speak. I can confidently say that, probably three or four times because every instance so the, it doesn't protect your cell phone itself, it protects the apps on your cell phone the individual apps on your cell phone. Uh, so uh, 
We designed techniques for automatically injecting custom protective functionality in existing software, and any software becomes self-protecting. And it does not interfere with the development process, and it, uh, provi we provide techniques for easy specification of the protections, so the automatically injected protections have a small impact on the size and speed of the program, have customizable functionality wherever the customer wants. Uh, if they want us to detect and alert them, that's fine. Notify, repair the damage, yeah, we can do that. You know, we can repair the damage. Retaliate, nobody chooses retaliate uh, for obvious reasons. Because if you lash out, you could be lashing out at the wrong, you know, the wrong perpetrator. Um, but just it's possible. And they're stealthy and resistant to detection and removal. And, and they're, I, I have to add this. And doing, using this technology is dirt cheap, OK? That's crucial. It's so cheap. It's automated, right? <coughs> There's no manual anything. And you go to the customer and you tell them, uh, uh, we won't interfere with your time to market. We won't interfere with your software development process. There were, you could imagine more secure techniques, but if you go and tell the, the, the software company, oh, we are going to get you to produce much more secure software, here's what I'd like you to do. And if it involves any change, absolutely any change in the way they do things, they will kick you out immediately. They don't want you interfering with that. It's difficult enough as it is. So anything that interferes, so when, when security competes with anything, you name it, functionality, cost, if it interferes with anything, it loses the battle immediately. It's like, uh, um, that's my experience. So we provide all of this very, very cheaply. It, it's compellingly cheap. Um, and uh, why should software self-protect, you might wonder. You know, why doesn't the app rely on your cell phone? Well, I think you know why. Because your cell phone can be compromised, your laptop can be compromised, and instead of being a source of protection, it could be a source of mischief. Uh, someone could break into your uh, device. Someone could physically take control of it. And uh, so self-protection by software is a second line of defense. Um, so one of the things about when we had, whenever we had a customer, uh, you know, how, how we reached the 500 million mark. By the way, that was 2015, and I hear that 2016 was a gangbusters year, so it's probably more like a billion now. But um, it, whenever we had a customer, they always insisted that we not tell that they're customers. And you can imagine why, because you don't want to give to the, to the adversary this gift of the, which technology is being used, even though it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. But just why give them that gift? So it's a, so I like, don't ask me which of my apps in my cell phone uses your technology. I know, but I can't tell you. You know, there's things like NDAs and stuff like that. Uh, well, I could tell you, but then, you know, I think there would be some penalties. I'd lose my, my house, they'd take my children, and, you know, they, <laughs> they, uh. So defense in depth is a good idea. Self-protection is a second line of defense. You want a second line of defense, you want a third line of defense. Uh, and it was successfully commercialized in two ways. Uh, one in the commercial sector, uh, the company was, uh, was acquired, Arts and Technology was acquired in 2013. Uh, and uh, right now it has 12 locations, six in the USA and one of each of these countries. Uh, earlier than that, the defense arm of the company, because there's two companies, there was two companies, defense systems and for the commercial, it was sold uh, by Microsemi, which is a 6.1 billion uh, corporation. And they kept the offices in West Lafayette here, so they're still here. So that's how, if you're wondering what is Microsemi doing in West Lafayette, that's what it's doing, it bought. It bought us out and it's, and uh, this was a joint inter entrepreneurial effort with uh, John Rice, who I'm delighted to see here, and Tim Korb, is Tim here? And others, uh, and, and it, it was really a very nice adventure. We all, I believe, have a case of uh, seller's remorse that's right, John. We, because we sold it when uh, it wasn't 500 million devices. It was, I think, 100 or 200 million devices. And 
you know, a tenfold, fivefold. It's significant. But you know, good for them. I mean, good for this is capitalism, right? They took a risk. It could have become zero, right? So, however, it does it does feel like seller's remorse a little bit. Uh, you will never hear about this company. It will quietly be profitable, but you will not hear about it in, in, in the news. You will, you know, the reason is, I, the one I told you, is we hush-hush everything. We don't tell you that it's there and it's installed. So it's quietly making money, but, but not, you know, it's where, well, if you read it in the headlines, it will not be in a good context, let me put it this way. <laughs> and in that case, you know, I think we will, John and I will lose our, uh, Seller's remorse at that point. <laughs> uh, so uh, so the, I, I told you the main idea. So the main idea of the approach is, so why is it, why, what's the underlying security theme is that, look, uh, I think you know that uh, the malware problem is essentially unsolvable. You know that. There's a proof of that actually in US, in one of the universities in California. Uh, I think Fred Cohen uh, gave a proof that you cannot, write software that gets rid of malware. And, and so uh, the antivirus task is an impossible task. You cannot do it, really. In general, you cannot have, there's, there's, it's undecidable, which is strong evidence that you're gonna have difficulty uh, solving it. Uh, and we turn this difficulty, so if removing malware is difficult, removing goodware is difficult also. Goodware is us. We are goodware. We inject something, new functionality that's protective in nature. That's us. So, uh, and we, you know, so, so, um, and we do a better job than malware. Why? Because malware, you, the malware writers have to do it without the cooperation of the software vendors, right? They're victimizing the software vendors. We do it with the blessing and cooperation of software vendors. <coughs> You know, there are customers. So we do a much better job of resilience and, and, and stealthiness because you know, they're on our side. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think I'm running low on time. How much do I have? Maybe another five minutes. Five minutes, I can finish in five minutes. So what I want to stress is this is a very cost effective approach. It's ridiculously cost effective. And this is what you want. So a, you know, it's the automatic, you want it done automatically. Manually is a non-starter, uh, usable on any software, and you want it separate from the software development process. They don't want you to interfere with their process. Uh, you want to have a facility for making, writing the protections very easy. You can specify at a high level what kind of protections do you want, detect, notify, retaliate, whatever, and then it gets compiled into the protection. So everything is high level and flexible functionality. Uh, you, could, you could change everything overnight. Change everything, which you could not do with hardware-based protections. Hardware-based protections are there. You're not gonna re, re, you know, reconfigure everything. You can't change it. It's in silicon. And it's resistant to attack. I can tell you stories about that, but uh, I don't have time. So I will uh, move on to the last open problem that I solved, uh, we solved uh, with my, with how you won. Um, so the previous, this is, a, this is a problem you can all relate to. It's very, very easy to explain. So let me tell you what it is. You have an array, one dimensional array. This, this problem arises in image processing. And you have a one dimensional array of values. You cannot assume anything about the values that they're small integers or anything. They could be arbitrarily large. And you want to slide a window of width w from the beginning of the array to the end of the array. You imagine the answer obtained that way. You don't actually obtain it that way. That would be too naive to do it. It would take nw comparisons. We don't want to do that. But you imagine sliding a window of size w. And for each position of the window, which is shown in red here, you compute the smallest entry. And that's part of the output array. So the input is an array of size n. And the output is an and an integer w. The output is another array of size n minus w. n minus w because once the window hits the end, it cannot fall off the end. You know, it's, 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 it's the end of it. So very simple, to, very simple to state. 
And what's the problem? The problem is we want to use only n comparisons. And I don't know anyone who thought it was possible before we did it. Uh, really, honestly. The reason people thought it was not possible because there's a proof that you can't find the minimum of n entries in less than n comparisons. Because each comparison knocks out one candidate. And so you're not going to do n over 2 comparisons or, or fewer comparisons. You, you know, you're stuck with pretty much n minus 1 comparisons. Minus 1 is a lower order term, so we say 1 times n. And people thought that this is so much more complicated than computing the minimum. Computing the minimum is you go through the whole array and pick a champion. What could be simpler than that? That is n. And that this complicated thing could not possibly be n. So people were surprised. There's a long series of papers where they progressively are shocked to find out. The first shock was that you could do it independent of w, in, in time independent of w. Uh, the first 3n comparisons was the first paper. 3n comparisons, widely cited, low-hanging fruit. A very easy, actually. I could tell you about it in two minutes. And, and I gave it as a homework to uh, 580. The 580 students. Okay, so they didn't solve it, but I, 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 but we use only n comparisons. Previous best was 1.5 n. So 1.5 n. There, are, there was paper, a paper about that. And you might wonder what's the difference between 1.5 n and, and n. In practical terms, I would say not that much difference. But we're professors, we're scholars, we're not just practical people, right? In the community. This attracts the attention of people. It's a puzzle. You know, and, and did you, you know, I want them to, to you like they go to a conference and say, did you hear? Did you hear that they, Purdue, where researchers were able to do it in one times n? Uh, yeah, we did that in one times n. Again, I actually, I still consider my, uh, some of my nicest results to be from the early 80s and and 90s, but they're beyond the sliding window, so to speak, for, uh, for, for this award. So I focused on that. I'm saying this in case this is taped. And my former students from uh, whose picture I did not show uh, feel a little bit uh, hurt. It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, they were here too soon. They, so I will open it, open it up to questions then. Uh, or well, comments. Thank, uh, I'm sure all your students are very proud of you. But questions for uh, Mike. Or comments. Or, or less than one N for the answer to that sliding window thing. Yes. yes. Well, yes. I, I missed the last part of this. But um, <clears throat> just from that one slide, it looked as though the solution could be somewhat related to your earlier minimum array, uh, minimum, you know, finding the minimum value within a set of columns and rows. That's Mike, a, would you mind repeating the question? Like yeah. The, 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 question, um, the question is that the last open problem looks related to the first open problem. That's a very good question. The, the, it's not really because we can, you, we can solve it using the first problem. Oh, okay. It's a special case of the first problem. But the solution would not be 1 times n comparisons. You see the? Right. And so it would be like 2n, 3n. They don't want that. So, so the game, and this is a different community. So the two communities are very different. The first paper was, was published in a conf conference called SODA, which, is, which consists of people who think constant factors don't matter too much. The last one is in IEEE transactions on image. Uh, one of the IEEE trans is the image processing community where they, you know, what do you mean there's no difference between 1 and 1.5? There's a huge difference between 1 and 1.5. So it's a different community. So we were, the audience was different. But you're absolutely right. You could hit it on the head with the first one and get an answer. But it would not, it would not attract the attention of the image processing people. The image processing people. Uh, you need something else. They're more practically oriented. And you're one of them, so you know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, Chris? Yeah, you presented a couple of problems where you're solving open problems, which uh, debated, debatably whether they're, they're by themselves practically uh, 
making a huge difference. But in the middle, you present something where it's a, you know, it's a real breakthrough in, in practical use as well. And is there, you know, how do those relate? How does it, I mean, so I, in, in the, yes, so the question is, I presented two things that are like rather theoretical, the first and the last. And then in the middle, there were those two that were eminently practical and, and with impact in the real world. Uh, uh, and how do you, you know, uh, relate those and, yeah. and compare? First, I would say this, this was deliberate. This was deliberate. So I chose results that uh, will tickle the mathematically oriented amongst you. And I chose results that will tickle the practically oriented amongst you. I have played, I, I have contributed to both. And so I, I, so I chose them deliberately that way. Now, I would say there is one result that combines both, and that would be the key management one. The key management one is, is ruthlessly mathematical. It involves very complicated proofs of security. I, you, would say, you could argue that most of the contribution lies in the uh, in the proofs of security and, and adversarial, adversarial models. Um, so it's not just an engineering thing. Um, the software protection one is a huge engineering project. Gigantic. You have no idea. So the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the time and money between a very good idea and its software embodiment is, is huge. You're talking years and years of time. I'm talking not an academic quality product. I'm talking about a commercial quality product. You know, it's, it's not, no bugs, uh, good user interfaces, uh, support for the product. It's, it's not just years, it's also tens of millions of dollars of development funds. So they're very different in nature and they're more different even than, 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 than what you said because it's a, you know, the, the, the software protection one is a giant engineering project and is more so than a conceptual because the concept is, oh, uh, the, the insight is, oh, malware is an impossible task. The antivirus industry has made a business model of it because whatever they sell you is doomed to fail, right? And, and they love it. They, lo they love to sell you the next one because they, the minute you buy it, you know it will fail because the, the ingenuity of the of the malware writers will make it fail. It's an undecidable problem, and so it's fantastic for them. Don't feel sorry for them. That's their business model. Uh, but you know, in in in, uh, um, so the insight is very simple: is well, we we'll use goodware. Okay, do it. And uh, yes, my question is actually more of a meta question, which is. How is it you move between these two very different types of problems, very different types of areas? And what, okay. what insights do you have for the rest of us? Is so uh, the, way, the reason I move between them is this. And it's, it's a very good question. So the meta, I didn't, I'm sorry, I misunderstood it as a meta question. So uh, the answer is very simple, funding. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it funding? My funding, 100% of it, is in security. So obviously, there has to be something in, of the type of two and three. For the open problems, one and four, uh, I had zero funding for them, absolutely zero funding for them. Uh, so why did we do them is a very good question. Why did we spend time on them? And was it responsible to involve a student in, in that? which has been open for half a century? Um, that is a very good question. I was ethical in the sense that I warned the student. First, I told the student, this is not your thesis. This is not your thesis. Whether you solve it or not, you will have a PhD. Uh, this is an adventure, a puzzle, that will likely end up in a bloody nose for both of us. And, but if we manage to do it, then it's, it's a nice feather in our cap. That's the idea, that's the psychology of it. And it was in the same way that some people cannot resist a chess puzzle. Or just generally, you know, my aunt could not, could not end her day without finishing the crosswords. She wasn't paid for it, you know, it was just some a passion for it. So I would say one and four are my passion. 
my deep love for algorithms and data structures, my very first love that I come back to now, and I will come back to when I retire, actually. You know, so my heart is in that, OK? But my, my, my heart is also in the others, because I couldn't have gone anywhere without it. But this is, explains the eclectic mix, the eclectic mix. And for those of you who know me, you know, if you come to me with a nice puzzle and say, Mike, how about this? I absolutely do not care if it's in the area of image processing or mechanical engineering or whatever. I, if it catches my fancy and if you can state it in a sentence especially. <laughs> like one puzzle-like sentence. Given this, can you do that with this performance? I cannot resist this. And I'm, uh, you, you are watching survivorship bias in action here because I have presented to you those cases where I did not have a bloody nose. My wife, Karen, who is in the audience, knows of a problem I worked on for seven years in the 1990s. And I had to have, in the end, a New Year's resolution that I will not touch it anymore. <laughs> because it was bloody nose after bloody nose after bloody nose. I could not solve it. I can tell you what it is. It's very simple to state. It's one sentence. And I could not get anywhere in it. Uh, and uh, by seven years, I don't mean every waking hour. I do mean one month each of the seven years. One full month of, of sleepless nights and all that. And just, I, you know, I, so I'm not, there is bias in the presentation. There is definitely survivorship bias, right? This is what it is, where I survived. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. Now that the Chinese have shown that quantum entanglement can occur over 10,000 kilometers, uh, what is there that will uh, defeat quantum entanglement and for key exchange? Could you repeat that, please? Quantum entanglement for key exchange. So quantum key exchange, quantum key exchange, uh, anything quantum, quantum computing, quantum cryptography are game changers. Uh, and, and they, uh, I mean, the quantum key exchange relies on physics rather than in, on cryptography. It's, in here, it's inherent. Well understood. well understood. It works. It works. Everybody thought it would not work. I remember the very first talk by the uh, Montreal colleagues uh, um, where people were saying, oh, this will never work if the table shakes. They'll get the wrong answer. But it, they made it work. And it works on fiber optic cables, first tens of miles, then handreds of miles. And it's, you can go out and buy it. Quantum computing is coming. And it will factor very quickly. Well, quickly enough. It can do factoring. And, uh, but they're not here yet. Quantum computing is not here yet. And, but the, anything quantum is a game changer. And I, you know, I, I think. It behooves us computer scientists to learn some more about physics and see what, you know, what, uh, I mean, the boundary between disciplines is very interesting. And this is a prime example of uh, something which is computer science and something which is physics getting together for a wonderful, um, wonderful combined insights and products like that. And entanglement, uh, even, I mean, Einstein had doubts about entanglement, as you know, because. It's, no, that, yeah, that was his, his doubt. The, the does not play dice with the universe was his doubt about quantum, about the, the probabilistic nature of matter. And, 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 but the, the entanglement looked to him like it violated the uh, speed of light constraints, that you could have two entangled particles at Force both. At distance. Yeah. You know, uh, With respect to your uh, practical work, the Arcan technologies, were you able also to write academic papers on that? Uh, did you disclose all yes. the uh, the principles, and it works in spite of that? Yes, yes, we have we have a we have an academic paper, we have patents. Uh, pretty much, patents were the way for uh, you know if you want to allow because they, they, the culture of industry is you don't disclose, you don't disclose anything. So, uh, but we had already disclosed in, a, in an academic paper that's widely cited. So the basic ideas were already out there, but they were refined over, over a period of time. 
And John and I, and, 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 and we have patents, because that's one way you can get executives, corporate executives, to go along with, with, with publishing, is if you tell them, this will be in a patent. It will be a barrier to entry for competitors. Besides, if you make $6 billion, I think uh, it's OK to not have a paper, right? They don't care about papers. No, you, you made $6 billion. We didn't make, we, no, no, this is, uh, MicroSemi is a $6 billion corporation. I didn't right. make, I didn't make hardly anything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, with that, I think uh, let's give uh, Mikhail Atala uh, a very big hand again. Thank you. Thank you.